Thank you. Good afternoon. We, uh, we know that we are the panel between you and lunch. So I can tell by your faces you're very excited about the panel and we want to go on and on and on. But we'll try and keep it short. My name is Anil Men and I'm with Cisco. Uh, and I have on my panel uh, very, very powerfully focused and successful individuals. So I'm going to introduce them and then I'll probably kick it off. Uh, as to what does this mean when we say making, um, uh, making make in India a reality and also smart cities. Let me first invite uh, to, the, to the dais here, Mr. Appa Rao, uh, Malwarupu, I just say Appa. Appa, come on over here, the uh, founder, chairman, and CEO of Centum Electronics, one of the largest manufacturing and electronics company in India. After him, I'm going to invite Shalini Kapoor, who's the Chief Architect for Internet of Things for IBM India, to join us. And then I'm going to ask Brian Gershon, who's a founder and fellow at PMC Sierra, to come and join us on the stage. So uh, what I thought I might do is I would set the stage, and then uh, we'll have a, a discussion and then open it up for um, for, um, uh, for any Q&A. Let me, um, when, when Mr. Vidya Shankar asked if I would chair this session and come and speak to you on Make in India and Smart Cities and IoT in particular, I was more than happy to do so, not only because we are here and I'm also a little afraid of Vidya Shankar, so I always say yes whenever he asks me to do something. Um, because, you know, they have a way of getting you, even if they're not in government. Um, <laughs> But seriously, I think this is one of the more interesting things that is happening in India. So I want to spend a few minutes just giving you a perspective, not only from an India context, but a global context, as to why, you know, I think um, um, Mr. Mohan Reddy said that um, this new government, whether you're from whichever political parties, there's a sense of hope. I, I'm a chief, deputy chief globalization officer for Cisco, and for the last one year, I travel 20 to 25 days a month, and so when I go to Turkey or Indonesia or when I go to Malaysia or to Korea or Japan or China, I can tell you about five years ago there was a lot of questions about India. There was a lot of questions, a lot of questions, but then suddenly no one cared. No one would even ask a question. Nobody wanted to know anything. Nobody else interested in it. But in the last one, one and a half year, there's been a great deal of interest all over again, and there's a certain level of interest and, and hope that India has turned the corner and is going to take its rightful place as one of the key leading countries in the world. And in that context, the issues that have been popping up again and again, as you know, with the President of United States visit here, um, has been this whole issue about Make in India. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Make in India, but connected back to, uh, to, to, to the whole idea of smart cities. And the vantage point just, you know, uh, Mr. Mohan already mentioned the fact about CII. I chair the CII National Council on Cities and Urbanization. But I was also appointed by the World Economic Forum to be the global chairman for the global agenda on smart cities. And they have a focus on India. And last week I was appointed to be the chairman for the US consortia after the Obama visit on uh, going after the smart cities, all the American companies uh, and the three cities that we have chosen, Ajmer, Allahabad, and Vizak. So in that context, what are the thematic points? What are the kinds of issues that we see? So I want to start with that. And especially because I'm dealing with people who are technologists, especially actually, you have forgotten more about technology than I know. I'm not a pure technologist. But I know one thing I don't have to worry about is making a presentation like some of you may have seen the YouTube thing where you make a presentation to a bureaucrat in Delhi and talking about cloud computing. And he actually seriously said, I don't like this idea of cloud computing. What happens when it's just raining? So, so I don't think I have to worry about that in this presentation. And when I talk about fog computing, we were afraid to bring up fog computing after that one comment. Um, but the whole idea here is this. What if, the question to ask whether you're a healthcare person or any other, is the question is this. What if you had unlimited computing at a reasonable price? What if you had unlimited storage at a reasonable price? What if you had unlimited bandwidth at a reasonable price? What if everything is connected to everything? Would you do healthcare the same way? Would you do education the same way? Would you do transportation the same way? Would you live your lives the same way? Would you run a city the same way? And the whole idea 
is that today we have unlimited computing at a reasonable price. If you just take the last 20 years, many of you are in that industry, if you look at the price of a MEP from 20 years ago to now, is now it's almost zero, they're giving it away. If you look, look at a gigabyte of storage from 20 years ago, when it was $700, to now where it is a couple of pennies. When you look at bandwidth, bandwidth is one issue, especially in India where the prices have not dropped, but globally the bandwidth price for a gigabyte uh, uh, is from $1,000 down to about $80. And it's dropping even more. The most important thing that has happened, and the one that we would want to speak to a little bit more, is the fact that we are going from several hundred million things that have been connected to several billion things that are going to be connected. And in the next 20 years, 50 billion objects are going to be connected, which means things have now reached the point where things are connected, things are digitally affordable, but here's the most important thing, and this is where I think a company like Cisco, a small company, can say with some, some authority, which is the internet is becoming video-based. Over the last three years, video as a component of the internet has gone up from like 20 or 30% to 70%. In the next three years, it'll be over 90%. In 2011, 2012, 20 families in America loaded onto the internet the same amount of data as the entire internet of 2008. In 2020, one family will load onto the internet the same amount of data as all of the internet of 2008. To give that in perspective, this last World Cup, not the World Cup that India is going to be playing, maybe, uh, the soccer World Cup, the game of death, the four, the downloads on the internet was six terabytes a second people watching the soccer games. This means the internet is becoming a video-based internet, which means healthcare cannot remain the same, education cannot remain the same. The dimensions of time and space, which is the way we think about work, the way we think about retail is no longer valid. We, do, we still say we go to work. We still say I'm going to go shop. We still say I'm going to go to Google. Like where do you need to go to Google? Why don't the Google come to you as a search? And this entire world is already here. So in that context, we are still designing cities. We are still designing healthcare practices the old way. We have people designing homes. We are designing cities. But you would not design a city today or a building today or your home today and say, I will focus on electricity later. I will focus on water later. But today we are still designing cities where ICT is not integral into the design of the physical infrastructure. So the first point we talk about in making cities and where Internet of Things come in is when all these things get connected, when instrumentation takes place, you now have things that were unconnected connected. Once you connect them and you have the data that comes from it, you should be rethinking the questions, not rethinking the answers. So the questions to be asking when you're designing a new city is, why is there traffic? And what we know from research is 40 to 60% of traffic in big cities, especially in western cities, especially between the times of 4 to 7, are people driving around looking for a parking space. They say an average Parisian spends four years of their life looking for a parking space. So the question to ask is, if I could get all the parking lots sensorized and put an app, and then you can get on and say, I have to go for a meeting, I'm running late, I want the closest parking lot, and I'm willing to pay more for it, would you not create a new economic engine for a city where the number two or number three source of revenue for a typical American or European city is parking? And yet 30 to 40% of parking spaces are empty. They go unempty because you can't find it. You're just driving around looking for it. Same thing with healthcare. Why do you need to go see a doctor when 80% of the time when you have to go see a doctor, the doctor himself or herself doesn't need to touch you. Somebody needs to touch you, but the doctor doesn't need to touch you. So why don't you instrument your entire system up and then do it digitally? By the way, the stethoscope is still an analog system. We should be moving into a digital stethoscope that can detect murmurs remotely. So when you go down the path you should be asking different questions. That is what we say smart cities should be. So we'll talk a little bit about what does that mean. You have a physical infrastructure of buildings and roads and airports and highways and bridges. You need to have a digital infrastructure that is seamlessly integrated into it. 
but you're going to have a complete different financing model for it, which means you need to have a financial infrastructure just as well to do parking differently, to do lighting differently, to have long-term OPEX models for delivering water and, and traffic management. So this is what we're trying to do when we advise not only in this government over here with all the different cities that we're working on, but also what we're trying to do um, as, as technology companies globally. I'm going to just take a pause just to summarize saying, you know, India has a very unique challenge. We can't talk about the Barcelonas, the Rios, and the Londons of the world. For the, and I, I, I say that because I oversee those. But the moment I talk about it, I say, oh, there's Barcelona, Nechelegayape. And it's true, but to ignore it is also just as wrong. Because you see, in India, the biggest challenge is we have 60% of the world's open defecators are in India. We have to still work through sanitation issues. We have to work through health issues. And we say 60% of Indians are under the age of 27, which is a great demographic yield if they're educated, if they're healthy, if they have aspirations, and if they're hopeful. Otherwise, it's a dangerous thing. So how are you going to take education and health care into the rural communities when all the doctors and teachers are sitting in big cities? This is where we come in, all of us in this room, saying, how do you create the digital technologies with new business models that you can take education into rural areas and, and health care and culture and jobs? So the first thing is for India, the model has to be different because of all the political realities and the historical realities because there are no mayors in a city in India to make executive decisions about a city. But we have to overcome those. But there are other things. So there are five things needed for a city to become smart. And where does Make in India come in? You need Make in India because electronics is already number one, if not number two, on the budget line item after gas and oil. We have all these hundreds and millions of children who need jobs and people who need jobs. So you need manufacturing. You need to think of cities as living labs where you deploy local technologies, cameras, software, middleware, so you can deploy it and then export from India into other places and create a new industry. The third wave of the digital world is going to be the first wave was the globalizing of IT services. The second wave was the globalizing of engineering services. The largest market, which is $19 trillion market worldwide, is the globalizing of, of urban services. City management will become a global industry, and that is a $3 trillion market. Traffic management, water management, police management can become a global industry. This is what we have to think about in Make in India. What are we going to be smart about? Is it manufacturing, textile? What solutions and software will we build? And how are we going to export from India? 